could all move to Tasmania, actually. That's... <laughs> <laughs> but then we would infect it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they might not be very happy about that. No. <laughs> it would be good for us. Yeah, that's all true. Mm. Do you have to do ward rounds uh, this afternoon? Not today. Today I've got uh, an academic day, so yeah. I'm working on a few papers that yeah. uh, we've been uh, slowly working on, evolving. Yeah. 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 That's good. All right. Um, I think we'll, we'll start. Okay. We have about 30, 30 people now. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. So we have um, for our seminar series, um, so we've recently rebranded and we're calling the seminar series the Melbourne Health Informatics Experts Lunchtime Seminar, which um, and it has an acronym of MIX. So for those who are joining us for the first time, um, the centre usually runs fortnightly seminars between 12 to 1 on Thursdays. So please, please keep an eye out for our upcoming seminars on our event right page. Um, or through the center's newsletters if you're on our mailing list. So this seminar is also endorsed for one Chia CPD point. So please retain your event right registration ticket for proof of attendance. And it's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Professor Renato Velomo, who is the Director of Intensive Care Research and Staff, Staff Specialist in Intensive Care at the Austin Hospital. Renato is also a professor of intensive care medicine at the University of Melbourne and an honorary professor of medicine at Monash University and a principal research fellow at the Florey Institute. Renato is a co-chair of the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Research Centre and he is also the editor-in-chief of Critical Care and Resuscitation and has authored more than 1,300 PubMed cited papers and over 150 book chapters and has delivered more than 300 national and international lectures. For the last six years, he has also been the list of the most of most cited investigators in clinical medicine internationally. So today he'll be presenting to us about the Data Analytics Research and Evaluation Center. Thanks, Bernardo. Thank you very much, Dawn, and thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I'm going to focus on the development and the activities of what we call the DARE Center, which is a joint uh, activity of the uh, University of Melbourne and the Austin Hospital. I don't have to spend too much time telling you that there's been a dramatic change with the arrival of electronic technology and the information that is available to human beings and that is stored and electronically available for uh, analysis, transmission, uh, and um, for the purpose of uh, data banking and administration. There are a variety of applications that have been proposed for what is now colloquially called big data. Uh, they relate to diagnostics, uh, prevention, precision medicine, research, uh, reduction of uh, risks associated with medications and potentially reductions to cost. And of course, a better understanding of population health. Uh, this has created a buzz around what can be done uh, with this newly found uh, large store of information and it's created inflated expectations. And this view is problematic because the community and politicians and administrators expect to be able to solve problems through it when in fact uh, there is no way that computers can fix the problem of the quality of the data that is entered in computers. And so life is not as simple as the magic that we believe big data may carry. And indeed, there have been multiple articles uh, cautioning people about it. Uh, we cannot make gold out of it. There is no guarantee of fairness, equitability, and indeed even veracity about the data that we're looking at electronically. We cannot guarantee the truthfulness of it. And of course, all the electronic media by which the world lives or dies, whether it's tweet or Facebook or TikTok, 
are open to the same problems of uh, falsification. And of course, if you have garbage that goes in, only garbage will come out. And then there is the issue of applying technology to understand this information. And of course, another buzz word or a buzz expression is the use of AI algorithms. And again, they've got the same problems. They've got limited ability to assess their veracity. They provide significant challenges. They're generated from EMRs that are biased by human decisions and they're just as subject as everything else. Uh, to the same problems of any other data that flows uh, in the direction of human beings. So a variety of jokes have been generated about big data as a consequences of all of these buzzwords. I particularly like this one. The big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims they are doing it. And I think that's a pretty nice summary of where things could be. Another problem with information is that whatever the information is that's flowing to the brains of human beings, the problem is not with the information perhaps, but with the monkeys that receive it. And Winston Churchill made this comment in 1949, which in my mind is uh, very relevant today and that is the expansion of information and ideas is massive, but unfortunately the men mental faculties and particularly the moral character of human beings hasn't changed one iota. Nonetheless, uh, the university and uh, the Austin Hospital have been working towards creating a system that contains data that is available for analysis that flows from clinical information obtained via the Cerner Millennium uh, electronic uh, medical record system, which can be combined with administrative data that have been uh, already entered as part of the Victorian admission episodes database with other ICU electronic data that is collected at the moment with other data from the business intelligence unit of the hospital and can be used for research purposes and for understanding of practice. Uh, here at the Austin via the DARE Center. So this process has taken a period of time um, and really began to develop um, in, in about sort of seven or eight years ago, has progressively uh, sort of seen a stage rollout of EMR uh, systems and potentially over a period of time has also seen the introduction of data flow into the components of the EMR that we use. And there have been different time periods with different completeness or lack of completeness of data over that period of time. Now, there is a whole lot of other data that exists in the hospital. They're not part of the data warehouse, but, but can be combined with data from the data warehouse. And indeed, we've done some work in that direction because of course, other units uh, collect specific data for their specific purposes in a hospital. Cardiothoracic surgery, for example, is part of a national uh, Australian New Zealand uh, Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery data set. The intensive care unit is part of the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care adult patient database, which contains 2 million ICU admissions. So there is a lot of stuff that's happening in parallel to what the EMR and the CERN system and the data warehouse is collecting that can be linked with it. And then there are other bits of information uh, that exist. Some of them are paper-based. Uh, some of them have become progressively electronic, particularly the last three years, and then can be merged or connected with the data that we obtain from the data warehouse. So what does the center kind of carry in terms of personnel? There's myself leading it. Uh, there is Natasha Holmes, who's a, an ID clinician, an ID specialist, who's the senior fellow working with me and directing the projects that we are involved in. We have two 
part-time data scientists, Nader Marhoun and Ray Roberts, uh, who work in association with us. We collaborate with Marcus Young. We don't have a photo there. Marcus is um, a person who's been deeply involved in the electronic data collection system of the intensive care unit. And we have a variety of other people we work with, particularly Richard Cole from Radiation Oncology and David Berlowitz from Physiotherapy. And we have students. Um, we've had, uh, we have a PhD student working with us, uh, Sabir. Uh, we will talk about that in a moment. We've got, and we've had uh, students in IT and data science who work with us. And we've got um, medical students doing their uh, MD research project with us and we've got three working with us on their projects at the moment. And we've got a consumer representative, uh, Michelle Garka, who's actually the head librarian at the Austin Hospital as well, and she's been tremendous uh, as a, a consumer representative. And that's what the DEA system is. We have a place, a physical location, um, on level six of the Olivia Newton-John, uh, next to a lab space. Um, we're staffed, uh, particularly Monday and Tuesday, because people work part-time. But of course, we're available electronically seven days a week. People have uh, been offered referral systems through the Austin Hospital. They can come with a research idea. We have a hub page and links that people can submit a request to discuss to us. Then we meet with these uh, people who've got an idea related to big data. We refine the data request. We review the protocol. We go through whether the data queries can be actually explored, whether the data actually exists, the quality of the data, the veracity of the data, and whether they are relevant to the question. And most of the time, you know, there's a lot of work to be done because people don't have a clear understanding of what the data look like, uh, how easily they can be extracted or not, and which direction the data would be going. And how the data may or may not respond to the question being asked. And then we have to go to ethics uh, and for data extraction, data analytics, and data publication. And that's got another element to it, both ethics and governance, uh, and that requires time. And if everything goes past these four steps, um, and we believe it's got merit and value, and it can be done, and it can deliver information that can be turned into a peer-reviewed manuscript, and that is informative uh, for uh, the community of clinicians, researchers, or administrators, then we proceed to data extraction and a lot of the data extraction requires quite a bit of data curation because the data that follows from clinical activity is always imperfect and then presumably if we are successful we generate the data output and the data output is not only the analytics uh, by statisticians uh, after the data extraction but also uh, the generation of a manuscript. And this is uh, the form that people have to fill out to present their project to us before they come to see us. And there are lots of questions uh, that have come to us. What can you do? Uh, uh, can you do things like natural language processing? Can we do machine learning, artificial intelligence models? The answer is yes. Yes and yes, um, can, can we proceed to publication? Do we have statistical analysis available? Uh, we can organize that. Uh, do I need data for my project? The answer is almost always yes, because when you're dealing with data, most people have a rudimentary understanding of the data availability and the data quality and data extraction and data analytics. How do I acknowledge what we do? Well, the answer is, and in the end, we end up being co-authors because we do so much work for these people that they will be unable to proceed without us. How long will it take to get my data? Well, it depends on how hard stuff is, you know, how big the project is, what information you want. It can be days, it can be weeks, and it can even be months. 
So what have we done? What have we done since we've been uh, working, which is now uh, two years or thereabouts? Well, we tried to do some work uh, in the area of sepsis. This is uh, a paper that we presented and it's been published uh, looking at the Q for quick uh, sequential organ failure assessment tool for screening patients uh, presenting to the emergency department. Uh, it's a tool that is used around the world, um, but it hasn't really been well validated or it hasn't been fully understood, which was defined by the consensus definition for sepsis and septic shock. And uh, it was proposed as a way of identifying patients um, very quickly by using the respiratory rate, the mental state, and the systolic blood pressure to identify which patients present into the emergency department with infection may be at greater risk of dying or ending up in ICU. It's very simple. Uh, it requires the presence of at least two of the criteria that I'm showing you in this slide, a respiratory rate equal to or greater than 22, an altered mental state with a Glasgow coma score less than 15 or a systolic blood pressure than 100. And the reason it was that these would describe patients that are particularly sick when they present with infection, but there was absolutely no validation of the utility of this in the, um, in the world for ED uh, in a systematic way, and certainly in Australia anywhere at all. So that we decided that our first project with uh, DARE was to do that. Uh, and uh, we proceeded to use the emergency department electronic data on vital signs. I uh, use the data warehouse where it's now present to do data extraction. We screen people with suspected infection with a methodology which uh, had been described before, looking for microbiological investigations and the administration of antibiotics. We identified whether patients were q sulfur positive or negative within six hours of the taking of microbiological samples uh, and the administration of antibiotics. And we linked all of that with various data sets uh, of outcome, administration, research, uh, emergency department. And we were able to uh, study 165,000 uh, ED Admissions, we were able to identify that about 7%, 7 of them were for suspected infection. And about 20% of them were Q-SOFA positive in the emergency department, about 78 were Q-SOFA negative. And of the patients that were Q-SOFA positive, uh, almost 13% uh, had died um, after that uh, index hospital admission. To give you perspective, if you come to the emergency department today of the teaching hospital and you've got ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction, your mortality is somewhere between five and 7%. So clearly these people are very sick and they don't do well. And if you combine the death and the prolonged ICU admission defined by more than three days in the ICU, the outcome of interest occurs in 17%. So we were able to identify that this uh, technique very rapidly applied to ED patients would help clinicians know very quickly that they were dealing with a person who was very high risk. And you can see these people stayed uh, in ICU longer, they would be more likely to go to ICU, stay in ICU for more than three days, stayed in hospital, for longer and clearly they had more hospital mortality. We were able to look at all sorts of characteristics of these patients, uh, the antibiotics they received, indeed the time that they received antibiotics compared to the time of ED admission. And as you can see there, even people that are QSOFA positive, they got antibiotics three hours after arriving in the emergency department with suspected infection. That's not very good. That's not very good. And so there is potential for improvement and identifying these patients early might allow us to improve the quality of care. Then we looked at people with cancer as a subgroup of patients with a suspected infection that might be particularly at risk. And indeed, that's absolutely right. And again, uh, they had uh, a significant prolonged stay in ICU and their uh, in-hospital mortality was 17%. So 
So if you got somebody with underlying malignancy diagnosed and under treatment in the last six months, and you turn up with a Q-sulfur positive to the emergency department with suspected infection, you have a chance in almost five of dying on that hospital admission. And that's a uh, survival plot comparing Q-sulfur positive to Q-sulfur negative patients all derived from such work. And indeed, following such work, we were setting up uh, to proceed to uh, developing an electronic code sepsis where people come into the emergency department and having a microbiological sample obtained and vital signs obtained would immediately be coded according to the presence of Q-sofa positivity and then trigger ICU team intervention. And that process was about to take place and it's currently held back by the COVID pandemic and the chaos that that's generated in the emergency department of our institution. We then decided to move on to looking at delirium. Delirium is a big deal in hospitals at the moment. Uh, and when you look at the patients that are coded by the hospital coders at hospital discharge using the International Classification of Disease, or ICD-10, almost 5% of patients admitted to hospital are classified as having delirium. However, when you look at the administration of drugs that are typically used to treat delirium, such as haloperidol, quetiapine, olanzapine, risperidone, during the same period at the Austin Health, you find that uh, a lot more people uh, are actually receiving these drugs in the hospital than the ones that are coded for delirium. And as I jokingly say, the Austin Hospital is currently the biggest psychotropic drug dealer in the Heidelberg community. So we decided to have a look at these patients and you interact with the DARE system, the coding of the hospital, the database of the medications, and you're able to look at people, but, but, and here's the problem of big data, you cannot actually really clearly identify what's happening at the coal face using big data. Big data is like a satellite view of what's going on in the uh, fair suburb of Heidelberg where I work. Uh, you just cannot tell what people are really up to at the shopping center or when they're walking down the street. You need to go and do a biopsy. And the way we did it is to take people in the intensive care unit that have been classified as having delirium and people in the ward that have been classified as having delirium and actually went into all of their records, all of the comments, all the comments by the doctors, the notes, the progress notes and everything else to try and identify what the hell was actually going on. And what we're able to find is that people that have the classification of delirium in the wards versus those are classified as delirious in the ICU are very different people. They get called delirious by the coding system, but they're like chalk and cheese. The ward patients are a mean age of 84. The ICU patients are at a mean age of 65. There is a clear difference in gender. There is a clear difference in underlying diseases. And the most striking feature is that people in the wards have serious neurological disease in their background. And you can see there, the severity of psychological disease or psychiatric disease or neurological disease in the patients in the ward that have delirium. And the ward patients are much more likely to be on psychotropic drugs in general by their GPs or, or perhaps in their nursing homes or in their special accommodation homes. It's massive. It's massive. It's massive. And it's a very, very different population. And indeed, when you look at their delirium, which is typically classified as hypoactive, where the patient is confused but not agitated or aggressive, or agitated, you can see there is a profound difference between people that are delirious in the ward versus delirious in the ICU. And, and that's really related to the use of psychotropic drugs. And then we got more interested in how on earth people thought about delirium. And we came to the conclusion that 
the way people think about delirious is by using words to describe the reality that they see. And we decided that delirium was uniquely, uniquely uh, targetable with natural language processing of electronic notes entered by nurses and doctors into, for example, the ICU system. And so we decided to apply uh, natural language processing, simple natural language processing based, for example, on index word analysis to the notes uh, entered into the ICU electronic system and use the DARE expertise to go and get that information. And you can see there, we looked, for example, at uh, 300,000 notes uh, written uh, in the ICU progress notes by nurses and registrars and residents and physiotherapists for a total of 60 million words. So off we went and we looked at the way nurses spoke or wrote about what they saw in the patients that they thought might be delirious. And you can see that they use words like agitated, confused, agitation, much more than the actual word delirium or delirious. Uh, and that is the language by which they describe what they see. On the other hand, the doctors speak about it differently. They use the word delirium a lot more commonly. It's their number one word. So there is a language uh, disconnect in the way patients are classified or understood to be in an altered mental state by nurses and doctors. And it's even more interesting than that, when you do a lexical dispersion plot and you look at the use of words over time, you see that whilst the word like confused has remained constant over time, and the word agitated has remained constant over time, the word delirium, which is in the fourth line, has progressively increased in usage by the healthcare personnel, suggesting that the terminology by which we describe what we see has been altered by awareness and education and uh, discourse in the literature. Sabia, our PhD student from uh, information technology has done more work in generating interaction graphs, looking at the impact of delirium and delirium coding according to whether you're admitted from home or not, according to your admission hour, uh, and uh, looking at the greater intensity of delirium if you're admitted to the hospital in the early hours of the morning and a variety of other variables uh, that uh, are associated with your risk of having a high likelihood of being coded for delirium. And of course, age is a dominant factor. Then now well, we've moved to looking at the use of novel medications for the management of diabetes. And now we are looking in collaboration with the endocrinology team at the use of particularly the uh, uh, sodium glucose uh, co-transporters and dipeptidyl peptidase for inhibitors, which are new medications that are widely used for the management of diabetes in the community, but for which there is essentially very little or no information about their prescription in hospital and the potential side effects, complications and efficacy and combined therapy in patients treated with these medications while they are in hospital. And you can see the data flow, yet there's another DARE project in, com in combination and collaboration with the endocrinologist. And you generate uh, a lot of really interesting data, which is unique in the world, uh, and you can identify lots of patient characteristics that are associated with the choice of a particular class of drugs such as the glucose co-transporters or the peptidyl peptidase inhibitors. And you can see a lot of things that are currently unknown to the world in relation to the care of diabetic inpatients. And you can see, for example, that if people are treated with sodium glucose co-transporters, 
they are significantly uh, more likely to be receiving insulin, whereas if they're treated with the dipeptidase inhibitors, they're more likely to receive other oral hypoglycemic agents, and that the people that receive glucose co-transported inhibitors are much more likely to have cardiac disease as marked by the use of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors of angiotensin receptor blockers. And then if you ask the question, yes, okay, what if you adjust for all of these characteristics, is there a difference in the ability to keep the patient within the target range that the endocrinologist and the literature would think is appropriate and optimal during the hospital stay of between four and 10 millimoles per liter, whether you are on one type of medication versus another? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So there is a clear difference in favor of sodium glucose co-transporters and this information uh, has not been previously known and it's got significant implications for the future management of these patients when they are admitted to hospital. And more work, we've recently done work about allergy and antibody prescribing with the infectious diseases group. Uh, this has been a progressive, a long uh, work which has required a lot of data cleaning uh, and identification of not only the medications the patients received, uh, but the timing of these medications, the timing of allergy identification, and the relationship between the two. And this is just to give you some idea of the coding to extract that information uh, generated by the data scientists in the DARE system. So it's a lot of work uh, for some of these projects. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it requires also a lot of dedication and commitment. And, and in our experience, it is particularly successful only when, only when the clinicians, the data scientists, the statisticians work together on the project from the very beginning and through it time and time again in order to deliver a product. Have we delivered product? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we have delivered uh, multiple publications uh, in peer reviewed journals uh, to the point of generating now one publication a month uh, from our system and it's continuing very effectively in collaboration with kidney disease specialists or endocrinologists or ICU doctors. And uh, it's continuing very successfully. And you can see a collaboration there with the ICU team, a collaboration below with the anesthesia team. And in collaboration this time with the medical emergency team uh, group. So, so in conclusion, uh, the Data Analytics and Research and Evaluation Center uh, has delivered to us multiple lessons, uh, multiple insights, and it's opened the door to interventions in the future by electronic alert system. DARE is now super busy. Uh, we're at it uh, very hard. Uh, we have contributed uh, and are an affiliation to the publication of 23 papers, and I said before, about a paper a month. As I said before, the key to successful collaboration and successful contribution and successful publication is that if you have a clinician alone, you score zero. If you got an IT scientist alone, you score zero. If you put them together, in this particular case, you score 23 uh, uh, PubMed uh, peer reviewed manuscript. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Renato. <laughs> Thank you for your excellent presentation about you and your team's incredible work in the DARE Center. Um, we have about 15, 20 minutes now um, for questions. So I'm just having a look on the chat and um, Mike says, great work, Renato. Um, can I ask about the model of DARE and how you keep that sustainable into the future? 
That's a, a very good question. So you may know, so DARE has been funded uh, for three years. And so it's a joint funding exercise. We signed off uh, two years and a bit ago by the Austin Hospital and the University of Melbourne to do a kind of a 50-50% deal. And we got funding until the end of uh, this financial year. And the funding provides uh, 0.3 FTE for my time, 0.5 FTE for uh, Natasha's time as a senior fellow, and 0.4 FTE for two data scientists and 0.5, no, sorry, and 0.2 FTE for statistical support. So that budget has enabled us to do what we are doing and what we hope to continue to do that. Um, whether, you know, with the current climate come, you know, May, June, 2021, the university has a, sufficient funds to continue to support this, uh, B, uh, the appetite to prioritize this kind of continued data analytics based work, uh, and, and C, uh, has enough funds to do that, uh, remains obviously unclear in the current climate. If they do, then I think we're very sustainable and I think uh, we can start becoming competitive for grant submissions because over three years we have created a publication and, and uh, a community profile that would put us in a position to go the next step. And to me, the next step is to do randomized controlled trials of database and, and data analytics driven patient identification and clinician alerting. And we were setting ourselves up to do this this year and to do some pilot work but everything has become impossible because of the COVID pandemic. Um, Mike has just added another comment. <laughs> he says that he thinks it's a challenge and maybe grants and other sources of, of funding such as commercial. Um, so Maureen has a question. Uh, she says, has DARE conducted any studies with other hospitals or has the focus to date been on analyzing data within Austin? So yeah, that's a very good question. So the answer is almost there. We forged a collaboration with uh, Peninsula Hospital in Frankston to look at uh, delirium and to do natural language processing. Uh, and the, uh, and there's an agreement in principle to do that. And we are currently going through the governance challenging of de-identifying uh, and then transferring um, what we think is about three gigabytes of data uh, to a cloud for us to do the analytics with Frankston in conjunction. So uh, it's happening. And, I, and I'm reasonably confident we'll get there by the end of the year. The biggest challenge is not uh, the data science. The biggest challenge is the governance. There's a great fear of privacy infringement, patient identification. Um, it's a big deal. You know, people are really worried about data breaches. You know, I get it. I get it. But it's creating layers and layers and layers of uh, governance infrastructure that makes going from one hospital to two or three more hospitals really very, very challenging. There is a data set, however, that is actually publicly available from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is derived from uh, the Beth Israel Hospital at Harvard. And they have de-identified it and made it public. And it's, it's got about 60,000 patients. And we've just and, and we've just got permission to permission to mine it, and we're currently just mining the natural language processing of that in relation to patient clinician notes, in relation to the use of words that are delirium suggestive, uh, and we've now moved up to something like six million words, uh, so six million mentions of those words. Uh, so we are attacking that process 
to validate what we see here at the Austin Hospital, because here doing the data work is doable, reasonably, I won't say it's easy, but reasonably open. You get ethics approval, you get governance approval, it's local, it's our data. But then you're always left with, oh my gosh, is it just us? I, I am relieved to say that from the preliminary data that we got from Harvard, the answer is hell no, this is all over the world. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's important to do that kind of external work. Thanks, Minato. Um, I have another question from John Patrick. Um, he says, have you found any gaps in the EMR data items that would have been useful or where necessary um, to complete in a given investigation? Yeah, yeah, you know, that, that's the, the, it's imperfect and there's no, no question about it. Um, and for many of the things you do, you have to do workarounds or accept that the data that you have is not the data that you wish you had. Uh, and, you know, we are setting up at the Royal Melbourne, the EPIC system. And we are already negotiating with, with the structure about how we can electronically download all of the electronic data flow that comes from the ICU monitors and it comes from the ICU ventilators. Uh, and then analyze it. Uh, doing that is incredibly challenging. If you don't do that, the only electronic data that is obtained is either data that comes from the lab. That's great, it's fantastic. It's electronic, it's, it's verifiable, it's high quality, it's got a time stamp, it's great. But then if you go to the clinical data, it's human entered. Ouch, 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 ouch. And that's imperfect. On the other hand, compared to what we used to have 10 years ago, it's absolutely uh, two orders of magnitude better. So we are operating, as I say to my friends, uh, instead of operating in the dark, blindfolded, we are now operating a very dim light in the corner of the room. There's still a glimmer of, of, of light. <laughs> tiny, tiny. Now let's not get too excited. Um, John has another question. He says, does this mean that there is a role for specialized or tailored clinical information systems to support research exercises? Look, yes, there is, but, but the systems cannot easily incorporate the clinician-based activities. You know, they can incorporate what the machines do, and potentially the monitors, the ventilators, uh, hell, um, even the, if you're gonna do robotic surgery, even download the movements of the robot, but they can't incorporate what human beings think, which is what drives the damn robot how they analyze the world, how they think about it. We can only see the actions or some of the output of the actions, which has been secretly and diabolically filtered by the human mind to present a censored, self-serving and self-esteem maintaining, non-revealing piece of information. It's really hard. Let's not delude ourselves that what's documented by clinicians is actually what happened or even what they thought. It is what is for public consumption. Okay, um, a couple of comments, um, Renato. So Maureen says, um, Perhaps we should have a chat as BioGrid may be able to assist with the governance matters you refer that is, to. That is true. That is true. Yes, I, I'm aware of that. Yep. And, um, and Andrew. Send an email. We, we can kind of work through a few things. I, you know, I think the biggest challenge that I have observed, it's not a challenge, actually, the biggest opportunity is to find clinicians and data scientists and lock them up in a room. 
And that's essentially, it's essentially what we have done with there. We got a space with eight computer stations and a room and every, now there's all sorts of things about social distancing, but every week on Monday morning for two or three hours, we are locked in that room. I mean, we're not locked, but we're in that room with a cup of coffee and we talk about the data, the clinical question, the interface, the data flaws, how to fix them, whether they can be fixed, how, how SQL can go and query, what the problems are, can AI be applied, can it not, what's the quality of data, what can it just, what else do we need to get, et cetera, where could it be, if we needed to get it, where do we find it, how good is it, all of that kind of stuff. You, you have to create that culture and that environment. If you don't have that culture and that environment and you're disjointed and disconnected, both at a human level and in terms of friendship in a very egalitarian flat structure where people can say what they think and they can say, oh, this data is crap. Or, you know, if you can't do that, my view is that you cannot proceed to high quality work. by a comment. Um, does anyone have any last questions for Renato? We, we also have a comment from Andrew uh, Turnpin who says that um, DARE has many parallels to the MDAC Centre at, at the university and he'll be reaching, reaching out for further discussions. I'm a chatty guy, happy to chat. Okay, so we, we, if no one has any other questions, um, we, we might leave it as that. Um, thank you very much, Renato, for your, for your time today. I understand it's very busy at the hospital, especially during these last couple of weeks. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, our next seminar in the series will be on Thursday, the, the 20th of August, um, and the next seminar will be co-hosted by CIS, and we have Dr. Jenny Waycott who will be presenting on technology for enrichment and connection in aged care. Yeah, once again, thank, thank you, uh, Renato. Bye -bye. And <laughs> okay. All the best. Thanks, everyone.